What is the heart of the good news? And what if people of importance oppose the message? I want to share the gospel, but I'm scared of being rejected. Is there help? Well, I hope to be of help to you today as I ask you to me in today's episode of Word Search. With me, Christopher Dryden. We're here. We're on episode six, Rulers versus Peter and John. Word Search is here to be a place to search God's word and also a time for God's word to search us. It's with the intent of encouraging godly character development while stimulating the importance of the primacy of searching God's kingdom and his righteousness in the hope that in doing so it will inform and transform our prayers and practice because here at Word Search it's our desire to find treasure in God's word so we can be hearers and doers of the word. On Word Search today then we're going to explore on the journey so far in our series exploring Acts chapter 3 and 4 about the mission, the message, the ministers and the members before going into today's episode where we'll be looking at part 5 of the rulers versus Peter and John as seen in Acts chapter 4 verses 5 to 12 where as ever we'll be considering the content, the concepts and the conclusions in this particular episode that should hopefully shape and inform our lives. And then we'll wrap up as ever with our time of praying, uh, where we'll have certain prayer points that I'll ask you to consider in the light of what we've learned today. Previously, what we've been exploring is an overview of a fundamental part of what I believe believers of Jesus should be, that they should recognize that every follower of Jesus is a member of the body of Christ and the family of God, that they are a minister for Jesus Christ, they're a messenger of the good news of Jesus, and they are called to be a missionary of the kingdom of God. And so when we remember those four M's, member, minister, messenger, missionary, when we think of those four M's, that should keep us in form to do and be everything pleasing to Christ. We overview of what I'm hoping to cover in this specific focus on Acts chapters 3 and 4, the different areas that I'm hoping that we can explore in this series. And previously in the series, what I'm hoping you will see when you uh, listen to it again, hopefully, or listen to it for the first time previously, we'll be Acts chapter 4 verses 1 to 4, uh, exploring in particular the concept of the arrest and holy convictions that were taking place there of particular use for today's episode is the fact that the message can and will irritate the guardians of the status quo. And so when you're upset or when you're concerned about others who are upset at you sharing the word, uh, maybe today's episode will reinforce that learn. And a big takeaway from the time of uh, last episode's section uh, was the aspect of should expect two responses from sharing the good news. One is the acceptance of the good news where people become members of the family of God. That's worth celebrating. And the other, as we'll explore further today, is we should expect rejection and indeed hostility to the message that we have to share. So on today's episode, I want us to explore carefully the encounter between the rulers and Peter and John, as seen in Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 12. But to give us a flavor of that entire scenario and that encounter, I'd like to join me in reading Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 22. And that says as follows. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, 
rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a criminal man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the corner stone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to see in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in the name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. I pray that there's a blessing that's on those who hear this, as well as a blessing on me, please, as I read this wonderful word, because I, I know that there is such a wonderful blessing to be experienced when we really meditate and contemplate God's word. Uh, and so I hope that you will meditate and contemplate on that as you read it and reread it and hear it again for his name's sake. So I mentioned we're going to be zooming in particularly on verses 5 to 12 and be considering carefully what we can see in that section. And uh, as we look at that, I find it fascinating. I find the whole paragraph fascinating in terms of the opening of the conversation between the rulers and Peter and John. What I find fascinating in particular, then, let's, let's look at certain things. Note with me, if you will, Peter and John are facing the rulers of the people. These are significant people in their day and time. So it's not as though they're facing um, like a boss in a workplace. They are facing people who have the power to genuinely excommunicate them from the community. And so they, they've, got a, they've got a lot of weight, these men, Annas and Caiaphas and John and Alexander. These are the big boys who have big says in the community. You know what we say, big says. They have a big say in it. So it's important to see who John and Peter are facing. And notice that I like how the scripture says they inquired. Uh, but the nature of their inquiry really is an inquisition. Uh, these people want to really find out, as the authorities, they want to really know what's going on here. How on earth has this happened? Uh, it's almost as though they didn't legislate for it. They haven't authorized it. They haven't given it a blessing or permission. And so how has this been allowed to happen? They must answer. John and Peter must answer for their actions. And to a large degree, when you think about it, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it's so subversive to the status quo, by that I mean it's not really, it doesn't really fit the way of life in the way that we live it. 
Um, it doesn't fit. It comes in and it interferes and it interrupts. And it says that, you know, you are living in darkness, but have a look at the light. And the light is seen by the wonderful works of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because it's so disruptive, then understandably, those who love the darkness or those who prefer the status quo uh, will have some questions about it. And they will want to impose their authority on the situation. They will want to make it an inquisition. Uh, and at this stage, we get to the heart of the one of the biggest takers, one of the biggest takeaways I want us to have comes to this particular message. And that's the fact that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit to speak. That is to say, uh, very much reminiscent of how in Acts chapter two, that people were filled with the Spirit. And then as Peter preached because he was full of the spirit in the same way, Peter is only able to address these great men in the community because he's filled with the spirit. It, we cannot stress enough. It cannot be underestimated just how crucial it is for us to speak as we're led by being full of the Holy Spirit. So, he was full of the Holy Spirit and able to speak. And notice one of the first things that he said uh, to the rulers was, you know, it, it highlighted the absurdity of the situation. Uh, I mean, it's absurd, isn't it? A man has been healed. That should be a point for rejoicing. That should be an opportunity for everyone to say, and what is the response to a man being healed? Those that were there to do the healing or through whom the healing was done, uh, they're around. Now, think about that for a minute. Imagine that you healed somebody and then you were arrested and put in prison overnight before you were summoned before a court hearing. Uh, so Peter is highlighting the absurdity of it all. If we're being examined for a good deed, all right, then if we're here, let's, let's make it clear to you why we're here. And we're here so that people can know. And this bit, this bit is great. Let it be known to you and all of Israel. So if you're going to give us this platform, we might as well use this platform uh, to say what needs to be said. And it's got nothing to do, with, uh, but it's got everything to do with. So they use the platform to broadcast it, not just to the rulers, but for anyone who can hear it far and wide in their community, in their sphere of influence. I just love that aspect of, okay, this is absurd, but we're gonna turn this absurdity around to claim what we've always been proclaiming. Now notice this bit very, very carefully. This bit about, it's the name, it's the cross and it's the resurrection. It's the name, the cross and the resurrection, the very heart of the good news that the, we have the good news because of the cross and the resurrection that points to power in the name. Healing takes place because there's power in the name of the one who was crucified and rose triumphantly from the dead. Because he has defeated, he can demonstrate his rule by actions like this. And so Peter is very clear. And this is, this is what I love about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is able to enable men and women to proclaim the centrality of Jesus for the glory of God. It's a beautiful thing. And able to do this. And then there's this bit that Peter says that is a reference to a scripture that had been mentioned earlier before. One of the insights that Isaiah had shared about the cornerstone, as in the stone that the builders had rejected, was now the chief cornerstone. How amazing it is that that which people think they can reject is actually foundational to this issue that Peter's going on to, uh, because it's not just enough to talk about the healing. It's not just enough to talk about the name. It's also vital, as Peter will outline now, to highlight the fact that this is a salvation opportunity in the light of a salvation issue. This man's healing is a salvation opportunity. It's an opportunity for people to hear the good news that this man who died 
and rose again with all power in his name can offer healing it's also exclusively in his name that salvation can be experienced by all men that's a big deal it was a big deal for his audience then and it's still a big deal for audiences today to hear clearly that it's only in his name that men can be saved okay so a good question to ask is saved what do you mean saved saved from what 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 are you talking about saved saved from what saved by what saved for what um all of those questions uh, are worth exploring and answering and we will do that later on in this honestly because uh, it's it's something worth delving into if you if you're still unsure but the big deal is it's a good thing to be rescued uh, from something that you don't want to experience to now be a part of something that you really want to experience as this man who's been healed has set up the opportunity for so he's been healed and despite the absurdity of the arrest now peter full of the holy spirit can use this opportunity to point out salvation exclusively in the name of this jesus who died and rose again with all power in his hand so it's just fascinating to look at those areas of the content of this section of scripture now when we dig further and look at some of the concepts in there especially in line with the conviction about, about members ministers messengers and mission let's look at this carefully so we're reminded again that messengers on a mission will face persecution so peter and john I like that clearly. The same Jesus that they're proclaiming is the same Jesus that warned them and told them that they should expect persecution. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. In that same chapter uh, and in that same section of scripture, Jesus would go on to talk about what it was to be persecuted and how should respond to that. And later on in the same book of Matthew, we discover how Peter uh, and John and the other disciples are warned by Jesus about what it is uh, to be in a position where people think that they're doing God a favor by persecuting those who are making a stand for sharing the good news of Jesus. So they've already been warned. So, so this is something that they've come to expect. But in that situation, this same Jesus who has sent them has sent them with the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to still function as they function. That is to say, a messenger on a mission will function because of the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in them. And the mission of Jesus will then be displayed as an opportunity for the message of Jesus to be declared. And that is something worth considering carefully. Um, so whatever you're doing on mission for Jesus, wherever you are, in whatever sphere of life, it should give you an opportunity to share the message because you're serving. You're not, you're not just serving people. You're serving God. And as a servant of God or a minister, if you will, wherever you are, that should be a great opportunity for you to declare this good news of who Jesus is, even to those who oppose it. The spirit of God can give you the boldness to do that. Another interesting concept to consider is that number of the themes that Peter talks about in this message that he gives to the rulers are themes that he will continue to talk about until he dies. Uh, how do I know that? Well, if you look at the first letter that, uh, that we talk about in terms of first Peter, uh, if you consider that carefully and you're going to ask me, well, where Christopher? I'm encouraging you to read the entire letter, first Peter. If you read that, you will see a number of these themes about the centrality of Christ Indeed, the very quote about the the uh, that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. You will see that quote in that first letter that Peter writes, and then in Second Peter as well, in terms of the encouragement about living in the light of who Jesus is. Again, these are themes that have been a part of Peter's life and John's life. Also, you can look at it in John's writings too. There's something about the message of Jesus Christ, that the power of the Spirit allows, not just for us to speak in the moment, but allows it to be a lifelong theme, something that resides in us as we 
meditate on it, as we come contemplate it, as we think about what God has done through us and in us in Jesus Christ. It's a theme that should that we should keep going and then use at any opportunity to share with others. And it's worth reinforcing the important concept that when we face great opportunity, it is the Holy Spirit power that is needed for us to be bold and clear in the central exclusive role of Jesus in salvation. It's only by the power of the Spirit and proclaim Jesus to the glory of God. We can't afford to do it in our own strength. We can't afford to depend and rely on our own abilities. It's when we are totally captured in the knowledge that we are the servants of God. We are the ministers of God who have been called to have a message to share with others that we can have the boldness of the Spirit of God to declare it. And by we, I really do mean we, all of us. All of us are given an opportunity to share the share the good news in some shape or form and it doesn't it won't necessarily be written in the book of acts as it's here but hopefully when jesus returns we will see that not only will our names be written in the lamb's book of life but it will be there because we have been faithful in sharing this glorious message even to those who would oppose it by the power of the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. So what kind of conclusions can we reach in the light of both the content and the concepts of this particular part of scripture? Allow me to share the following. Let's remind ourselves, God sends us on a mission with a message. Let's remind ourselves of that fundamental point. God sends us on a mission with a message. And that message, once that's delivered, we should expect rejection from sources of great influence. In the time of Peter and John, it was the rulers of the Jews at that time. But in this day and age, don't think for a minute that the message of Jesus Christ is palatable and is received with warmth and embraced with greatness by those in the world. It is not. And they will often treat it in a hostile manner and look to persecute you for it in ways great or small, subtle or overt. You should expect rejection from great sources of influence. In the light of that, though, it's on us to rely on the Holy Spirit, completely depend on the Holy Spirit. Ask God all the time to fill us with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to serve and then the Holy Spirit to say what he wants us to say. The Holy Spirit to serve, and then the Holy Spirit to say what he wants us to say so we can be effective in delivering the message. That's a big takeaway that I want us to get from that. And notice again, in the message that we have to share, there is an opportunity to rejoice. Rejoice in the salvation that Jesus offers, and rejoice in the healing that is possible in the name of Jesus the Messiah. Just, just rejoice knowing that as we get to demonstrate the rule of God through healing, so we'll have the opportunity to declare the good news to others so that at least they have the opportunity to accept or reject. In all of this, meditate and contemplate. That's also as a big takeaway. Endeavor to be clear in the nature of the message we're sharing. Let's, let's endeavor to be clear why this word is written for us. It's written for us to look at, to read, to comp contemplate, to consider carefully and say, God, remind me again, what is the good news? What have you done through Jesus Christ? What did Jesus Christ do? And why is that such good news? And why can that make such a difference in our lives? That's a big takeaway. I mean it, it's a big takeaway, not that kind of takeaway. It's the truest takeaway uh, that you can, can consider in life in terms of just contemplating and meditating on the wonder of the good news of Jesus Christ. So in the light of what we have seen in the content of the scripture and concepts that underpin the scripture, 
and indeed the conclusions that we can reach because of that scripture. Here are some prayer points that I want you to consider in your day-to-day life. Your first prayer point is to really praise God for persecution. That sounds bizarre, I know, uh, but we should praise God for persecution because persecution is a good sign that you are doing what God has called you to do. It's a good sign. And even if in countries like England and in America and elsewhere, it might not appear as though persecution is as obvious and as rampant in other areas, and we should pray for those who are being persecuted and whose lives are being taken for the sake of the gospel, um, we should still be able to acknowledge and understand that even in so-called uh, Christian countries, there is still an opposition to the gospel. There is still a desire to dilute, pervert, distort gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you make a stand for that to declare the true gospel of Jesus Christ, the persecution is still real. It's still real in the workplace, even still real in certain aspects of the church, but it's no reason to be depressed. It's a reason to praise God. That's your first prayer point. Your second prayer point is to thank God that he has given us his Holy Spirit to help us in being faithful to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank God for the Holy Spirit that he gives us. And then after that, your third prayer point is to ask God to help those in the gospel. Um, In this day and age, it can be a challenge. Uh, it, It is a challenge for you. And it may be a challenge for those who are called to be things like evangelists and whatnot. Um, can be a challenge, but just ask God to help. Remind us again, give us a, 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 a fresh vision of this glorious gospel so that we can see again why it's so crucial to declare it and demonstrate the rule of God and uh, as we do so as we pray for others. We're also praying for ourselves that we will likewise be bold to share the gospel whenever the opportunity arises. As we also pray, let's pray for clarity in the message being shared. Let's be clear on the centrality that this is about Jesus who died and rose again. This is about Jesus who rules and is able to save. This is about Jesus in whose name men must be saved. It's the only name by which men can be saved. That might sound controversial, in a day and age where there is so much diversity and plurality that gives you the impression that there are many roots to God. But faithfulness to the same God that rose Jesus from the dead requires us to have that clarity in the message that we're sharing. And then your final prayer point. I know the first prayer point about praising God for persecution might sound a bit odd. Uh, This one will sound a bit odd as well, but let's celebrate the fact that ruling authorities will have the opportunity to hear the message. Let's celebrate that reality that it, there won't be any case in which they will not hear the gospel. They will have opportunities, as God sends influential men and women from all walks of life, to let the rulers know that there is a God who reigns over all, is the Lord of lords, as well as the King of all kings. And let's pray those particular points, understanding that kingdom people apply kingdom practices in kingdom pursuits for kingdom purposes. Next time on Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden, we'll have the opportunity to explore episode seven of our series when we look at when rulers rule and God overrules. That's going to be one for you to listen out for when rule, rule and God overrules. That's next time on Word Search with me, Christopher Dryden. In the meantime, please remember to like and share this particular uh, video or whatever it is that you're listening to. Like and share it wherever you are and subscribe to the channel so that you can also to catch up on the latest episodes of what's going on with Word Search in this series. Uh, support the channel however God leads you to do so. There are details about how you can do so in supporting the channel and the efforts that we have here. 
But the biggest way that we would like you to support what we're doing here is to apply what you learn to your day-to-day -day life. However you can support somebody who's sharing the gospel, however you can learn to share the gospel, however you can see yourself as both a member, a minister, a messenger, and a, and a missionary, however you can understand and apply those things, that would be fantastic. Uh, not for me, but for the glory of our great God. So please put it into action. And, and for all of that, thank you very much for spending the time to listen to this episode of Word Search, where here at Word Search, we're really keen that we should see treasure in the Word so that we can be hearers and doers. I've been Christopher Dryden. This has been Word Search. Thank you so much. God richly bless you and share.